If you are thinking about harming yourself or suicide, stop and listen to this entire episode. Or if you know somebody who is thinking about harming themselves or suicide, send them this episode and be a gift to them and their life. It only takes one person to change a life. And me and Mark Hennick in this episode talk about navigating suicidal thoughts, the relationship between purpose and suicide, and the journey to recovery, as well as not identifying with our thoughts and feelings, but who we really are. So stay tuned, and I appreciate you. Everything changes. This too shall pass. Everything shall pass. Whether it's struggle or celebration, both hate and love will evolve and change over time. And I think that helps us to get through difficult times by realizing that it won't always be this hard. And it also helps us to be more grateful uh, of the things that we love and that we enjoy. At least I hope it does, because those things won't last either. So if you can get into this place of, of impermanence, uh, then nothing is forever. It helped me anyway to cope with those really difficult times uh, and also to really cherish and amplify uh, those great and positive times. So don't make any rash decisions, of course, that uh, things will change. Uh, it's, it's up to you if you actually see them change. The first and best victory is to conquer self. Welcome to the Conqueror Approach, a journey of self-mastery. To cultivate our mind, body, spirit, financial literacy, and allow our light to shine upon the world. Brought to you by me, your host, U.S. Navy submarine veteran and entrepreneur, Musa Mikkel. Let's conquer. Welcome back to The Conqueror Approach. I appreciate you for tuning in. Today, I have Mark Hennick. He is an internationally recognized mental health strategist, advocate, speaker, podcaster, and media commentator. His TEDx talk is one of the most watched in the world. He regularly speaks to diverse audiences about mental health, hope, and recovery. He is the CEO of Strategic Mental Health Solutions, a boutique consulting firm that specializes in helping organizations and individuals to move strategically from basic mental health awareness toward meaningful, measurable action. Mark holds a Master of Science in Child Development, and he's appeared on more than 100 television segments and countless of radio, print, online features, and podcasts about mental health. His TED Talk, Why We Choose Suicide, is amongst the most watched in the world with nearly 7 million views. He is the host of the Living Well podcast and the author of So-Called Normal, a memoir of family, depression, resilience, available wherever books are sold. Thank you, Mark, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Man, and and like I was just mentioning to you, uh, what you do is something very near and dear to my heart. And I just appreciate all the work uh, and the mental health work that you do and the advocacy because that the more people that are talking about it, the better. And, you know, today's going to be kind of a tough conversation. It's going to be hard for some people to listen to. However, it is the reason why I created this podcast. So without further ado, I just want to ask, because you have a story around mental health and suicide, uh, and you talk about it in your TEDx, but like what led up to, because when we talk about suicidal thoughts and th- these things don't just happen overnight they're a developmental thing uh, and they could be a cause of many things compounding on each other and what feels like endless suffering so tell us a little bit about your journey on what led up to your suicidal thoughts and and that happening sure you know i mean you're right these are hard conversations for a lot of people. And I think though that we need to have hard conversations. And that's why ever since high school, uh, I've been speaking openly about my own uh, lived experience with depression, with anxiety and with multiple suicide attempts. Uh, It started for me when a teacher found out that I was first uh, suicidal when I was only 12 years old. Uh, and I was, that was the first time I was brought to hospital, but I think I'd been struggling for years before that anyway, you know, growing up in a broken family, my dad had left, I didn't really have any 
powerful or, 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 or useful role models in my life. Uh, my stepfather was uh, emotionally abusive to my mother. Uh, my sister and brother, my older sister and brother moved out. Uh, and I felt isolated and alone in this little house in the woods at the end of a long dirt road. Uh, I wrote about it uh, in, my, in my new book that you mentioned at the top there, so-called normal. And really going back and looking at that experience and then looking at what I dealt with uh, in the intervening years, I thought, well, no wonder, no wonder I was struggling so much. And especially when I looked back from that first uh, hospital visit when I was 12 years old, when people first found out that I thought that suicide was my, my only escape from this life that I had found myself in. It wasn't just for the sake of dying. It was that I didn't want to live the life that I was living. And I had no other, I had no other ideas for how to not live that life uh, except to end it. Um, and then when I looked at the subsequent uh, suicide attempts over the next several years, they kept getting more and more dangerous, more and more uh, closer and closer uh, to the metaphorical edge and then eventually to the literal edge. The story that I tell, the second of the two stories that I tell in my TEDx talk, I had climbed up over the railing of a bridge in my hometown, stood on about an inch and a half or so of concrete and was entirely ready to end my life uh, because I felt like I had bounced around in a mental health care system that not only wasn't designed to help people like me with complex needs, uh, but it was never built properly to begin with. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't uh, designed to meet my needs. Um, and if it wasn't for a complete stranger who stopped that night and who talked to me and uh, who spent time with me and connected with me, uh, not, like a, not like a doctor and a patient, but just another human being. Uh, if it wasn't for him, then I wouldn't be alive here today uh, to share these stories. So, you know, after that man saved my life, and actually, ultimately, he ended up, as I say in the TED Talk, uh, grabbing me and pulling me off of the edge of the bridge when I had let go of the railing. Um, he saved my life in that moment, but he actually gave me a model for who I wanted to be for the rest of my life. I wanted to be like that stranger uh, who had each other, who, who had other people's backs, who reached out, you know, metaphorically uh, and saved other people. So really that's what's been motivating my work uh, ever since. I started speaking openly about my own experience just a few weeks after that, actually. And uh, it's really become uh, the, the cause or the purpose, uh, the orienting principle for my entire life uh, since then, back in the early 2000s. Super powerful. And, and when you say the mental health industry didn't really support you and your needs, can you mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, what was that like for you? I had felt, you know, there's a there's a relatively small group of us, although more of us than you would think, uh, who come to be known as frequent flyers of the mental health care system. It's a bit, it's a derogatory term, a way of dismissing uh, people who the more help they need, the less help they get, uh, because they show up. We show up at hospital. Uh, we're suicidal because we don't have the skills that we need to manage our distress. Uh, and then, you know, we get admitted, treated for a while, uh, released back into the same situation that probably contributed to our struggles to begin with. You know, I say in the book, the, the old saying, nothing changes if nothing changes. Uh, and for me, I felt like the, the healthcare system was just designed to fix me as though I were a problem. You know, that, that I, like I was a broken down car on the side of the road. And if they could just tinker with the right chemicals or wires or, or whatever it was inside me, that I would suddenly be better. And that left me feeling uh, like uh, maybe I was uh, unhelpable, like I was just so broken that I was one of those uh, people who just drew, drew the, the short straw in the genetic lottery uh, and that it would never get better. Uh, and, you know, that's what we know now uh, from research in uh, stigma prevention and st stigma reduction is that when you bang that drum of biological determinism too hard, when you tell people over and over again, your brain is broken, uh, you were just born this way, you were just you're just different. That actually it's actually not helpful. Uh, and there's, I think it comes from a good place to tell people the intent is it's not your fault. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a chemical imbalance. That's partly true, uh, but it's such an unsophisticated, I think, framing of what's really going on that it discounts the things that are in your control, your thinking patterns, for example, your thought distortions, uh, your coping mechanisms, your social surroundings. There's so much more to your mental health than only your brain. And really, that's my mission now is to help people understand that, yes, your, your brain is absolutely necessary uh, for your mental health. 
but I mean, your brain is necessary for everything. You wouldn't be here if it weren't for your brain, of course, uh, but it's not sufficient. There's so much more to it. And that's what was missing, I think, in the healthcare system that was trying to help me. It's like they were just trying to fix my broken brain. Uh, and that isn't where 100% of my problem was. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's kind of the issue with all medical systems, in my opinion, right? They just try to pit, patch up the things that are, are messed up or broken or, or correct the symptoms. Um, but like you said, even if it is a real chemical imbalance and it's a real thing, like what causes that? Like what yeah. thought processes cause that? What, what emotions, what habits, mental habits or thought processes cause those changes in your chemistry? You know, I think yeah. that that's when we start getting to the root cause of things. And, and, you know, just, just to go back on your story, because I believe it's so fascinating. It's just a great model of what, what's possible. Right. And what, what were some of the signs that you felt you were displaying that went unnoticed or general cries for help for someone who is feeling like you were, or have suicidal thoughts? What are some, some of the signs that people can recognize? Because I think that was it. That one man connected with you. Yeah. And that showed you that changed the trajectory of everything. Yeah. Look, right. for me, I, I think if you, if you want to do uh, prevention, whether it's suicide prevention or mental illness prevention, and I think that's the step before, actually, if you want to prevent suicide or if you want to reduce the numbers of suicide, reduce the number of depression uh, of people who are experiencing major depressive disorder. There is a causal link uh, between those two things. It's not all, uh, absolutely not. Uh, but if you want to move the needle on depression, uh, really tackle or move the needle on suicide, rather tackle depression. Um, and for me, you know, I think if you look at, at the um, uh, signs before the signs, the risk factors, I was I was inundated risk with risk factors for mental illnesses uh, and for the trajectory that I was following. I was coming from a, a, a single uh, mother uh, home. We were struggling financially. We were poor. Um, later on, we went into a blended family where there's a significant amount of toxic masculinity and of dismissing emotions of, uh, of fear uh, and trauma the, that we had experienced. Uh, combine that then with the lack of resources too. So you have the kind of positive, uh, positive in terms of additive or additional things being layered on those active risks. But then on the other side, the, the um, stuff that's taken away, the resources, the knowledge of, uh, that, uh, of the people in my life of what to look for, um, the places to go. My guidance counselor uh, in my school, who was one of the first people who repeatedly uh, tried to help me, had no other options but to bring me to the hospital. It's not like we had even basic services in main, many urban areas like caseworkers, people who will go out and uh, try to connect you with services. I was in a small town and like most small towns, we didn't have that kind of thing. We didn't even really have specialized child and youth care. Um, so, you know, there, there's um, those twofold things. There's all the risk factors. People make it through lots of risk factors if they have the supports to offset and I didn't have uh, those things. So really, uh, you know, going back through my medical records for the book, again, it was like, I, I saw it and I was like, yeah, of course I struggled the way that I did. In addition to my own temperament, probably my own uh, biological makeup as well, uh, I tended to be more vulnerable to that toxic combination of uh, heightened risk factors and lower protective factors. Gotcha, man. That That is huge for people to to realize i feel and and now moving that you what was what was some of the beliefs or anything really that helped you navigate from that space where you were depressed where you were on the ledge from finding yourself with purpose in the coming years after that yeah i mean that was a that was a long trajectory and i just realized actually i didn't so in terms of my um, initial manifestations or my initial signs and symptoms. I didn't get to that part of your last question. Um, for me, it was withdrawal, um, which a lot of people probably didn't notice because I was uh, introverted anyway. I was a bit of a quieter kid anyway. Uh, so they probably didn't notice that I was pulling back and not uh, engaging as much with people. Since I was in school where, our, you know, kids spend most of their time in school, just like adults spend most of their time at work, uh, my grades had started to drop. Uh, and I had always identified as a pretty smart kid before, but suddenly I'm failing. Uh, and that was virtually unheard of for me. I was irritable and impatient a lot. 
gets often dismissed as just a regular, you know, teenage angst. Uh, I was a, I was an emo kid anyway, I think. Uh, but it also turns out I was depressed too. So there's there's some of these manifestations, especially for teenagers who are going through a lot of change anyway, early teens in particular. Um, where they were ac outward signs uh, that I was struggling, but I think a lot of the time they got dismissed as just a kid uh, or just a teenager. It's just a phase. Um, I grew up in an economically depressed area too, so everybody has it hard. You know, what makes you special <laughs> that you have it hard? Uh, so then for me, with, with all of those things going unrecognized, bouncing through the system then for, uh, you know, a number of years, what changed for me, I think, was something that I didn't realize had changed at the time. After that stranger, who at the time, I only knew him as the stranger in the light brown jacket, uh, because that's all I could see. The way that I was balanced on the edge of the bridge, uh, and I could look over my shoulder, I could only see that it, in the dark that he was wearing a light brown jacket. Uh, after he saved my life, uh, I many years later realized that it had implanted this image in me uh, of how somebody could be watching a situation uh, and then juxtaposed to somebody else that I also mentioned in the TED Talk, who was standing uh, at the barricades mm -hmm. that the police had set up at the time. Yeah. And that other stranger shouted out for me to jump and he called me a coward. And I, was, I, I think I ruminated almost to an unhealthy degree. I fixated on this, this juxtaposition of these two strangers watching this same situation unfold in front of them, yet having two very different responses. And just the symbolism of this man who had my back, who reached out and saved me, versus this guy on the sidelines uh, who, who didn't want to get connected uh, to me, who wasn't interested in my story, uh, who, ironically, he was the coward uh, because he wasn't, he didn't have the, the bravery that the stranger in the light brown jacket had to actually approach me. So then uh, more than a dozen years later, I knew I needed to find this person uh, who I, I later realized had played such a critical role in my life. And I went on social media. And by that point, I had done a lot of television. So I went on national television here in Canada. And I asked for the public's help in finding this guy. And sure enough, by the end of that day, uh, we actually found him. Uh, and it turned out he had already written me a letter in case someday he ever found me too. Uh, so they sent me the letter and I found out how, how afraid he was that night, how he didn't have any training, any skills and how to do this stuff, but he knew he needed to help. And I think that was what changed for me uh, in those very early days, it was that first domino, uh, that I wanted to be like that guy. And that's what gave me purpose. It gave me, it gave me something to do <laughs> with all of this passion and emotion inside me, was to direct it toward helping others and reaching out to others and speaking openly. So as much as my advocacy is to um, you know, to change the system and change conceptualizations of mental health, it's been intrinsically uh, or inextricably rather connected to my recovery as well. Um, I advocate because I need to advocate. Uh, it's part of who I am and it's been part of my recovery as well. That's such a powerful story, man. I get chills when, when you talk about it. And, and I want to talk because you, you, you have a, such a purposeful intention now and that kind of changed when that happened, how does a sense of purpose relate to suicide? Yeah, you know, when you're in that suicidal place, and you know, it's it, these types of experiences are highly individual, but what seems to be pretty common is that you're lacking hope uh, and you're lacking a sense of self efficacy, hopelessness and helplessness. Uh, you think that you can't do anything about your situation and you think that there's no point in trying. Uh, so that's what brings you to that place that, that you're just so, um, the image that I use in my TED talk collapsed, this perceptual collapse that happens around you, uh, where you, the blinders go on, you can't see anything outside of that moment, it's this constricted, dark, tight place, and you think that that's the only way it can ever be. That, of course, is your depression lying to you. Uh, and what I now realize, uh, you know, after having done a lot of both inner work and academic work on this, what that stranger had done for me was to introduce a bit more expansiveness, a bit more uncertainty, to breathe a little bit more life into that closed, dark, tight place. So that way I could lean into that uncertainty a little bit more and find more options uh, that might be out there for me. Uh, and that's what allowed me to find that purpose of wanting to use everything that happened to me uh, for something. You know, I think that was the realization for me when I had been drowning in the stigma of being a mentally ill person 
And I thought I knew everything that that was supposed to mean. I mean, based on the newspapers and TV shows and movies and, you know, mentally ill people are supposed to be violent criminals and homeless or uh, none of that stuff is is statistically true, of course. Yes, of course, there are criminals who happen to have mental illnesses. And yes, of course, there are homeless uh, people who happen to have mental illnesses, but that's not necessarily a correlation. Well, with the homelessness piece, it, it, it is, but certainly not with violent crime uh, in particular. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't have other people introducing that information to me. So I thought I was going to be stuck in that identity. And then when I realized I didn't have to be stuck in that identity, that I did have some agency, I had more choice than I thought that I had, I got to tell my own story. I didn't have to be, uh, I didn't have to have my story told for me or to me. And that's how the whole healthcare system I felt like was designed. It was it was about telling me what was wrong with me uh, when really I was the one that got to use my own voice uh, to say what my experience was going to be. And you know, I'm I'm I'll for the rest of my life be grateful for my writing process, the process of of writing my book, uh, to really to really understand that that everything, as Anne Lamott said, everything that happens to you uh, is material. It's, it's, it's something that you can use, you own it now. Uh, and that I think is incredibly freeing to know that you own your story uh, and you get to decide what you do with it. So that's, that's what saved me, I think, to move from that place of hopelessness and helplessness to realizing that I actually had power. I had power inside me that I didn't know that I had before. Uh, and I got to make more choices uh, than I thought I had. Such a powerful story. Would you say that writing the book was was a part of even further recovery? Just just putting the thoughts, the ideas, everything out on paper and actually expressing it in that form? Because I know journaling is yeah. a, a helpful way. Would, would you say that is a great tool for someone who is stuck in their head? Yeah, you know, it was transformative for me writing my book. And I had I had been writing, you know, for a long time and I thought I was a reasonably good writer, uh, but the book was was both challenging unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. I mean, it's just I think it was Hemingway who said writing is easy. All you do is sit in front of a typewriter and bleed. And that's basically what I did. You just dump everything inside you out if you're doing it right. Anyway, my I'm, I guess I'm a method writer, if that's a thing. Uh, where you just totally bring yourself uh, to it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I remember distinctly, uh, I went away to a Trappist monastery in the woods for more than a month to write out this first draft. And I send it off to my editor and and I thought it was done. I thought, okay, that's great. There's the catharsis. I got everything out that I ever wanted to get out. And then we did 14 more cover to cover edits or 12 or 14 more edits. So that was a whole, I think that's for me where the healing really happened was in the editing, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Like there's this catharsis, get all that raw material out there. That's great. But then there's the question, well, now what? <laughs> what are you going to do? And I think that for me was going back and, and seeing how things connected and being able to pull a thread through my story to give it purpose. And it was until I did that, I didn't realize how, uh, how much my, my past was just below the surface of my present all the time. In every interaction, every relationship, you know, every conversation practically, my childhood, my trauma, uh, all that stuff was bubbling just beneath the surface. And now since having written the book, um, it, it's a whole different normal for me because it's like I pulled all that stuff out in the writing process. I worked on it. I put it back in differently. And now I find that the stuff that was so vivid for me in my past, a lot of it has kind of just disappeared in a way, or it's almost like it was, it was able to put it in the bottom drawer of my memory and not worry about it anymore. Whereas before it was always right in front of my face. And, and I wasn't expecting mm. that to happen. I really wasn't. That's a huge piece right there because a lot of the psychologists, and I believe this myself, say that once you fully express something or fully feel it, then it, there's nothing there left to feel. Yeah. Right? And I, I think that's kind of what contributes to depression. And I want to yeah. get your thoughts on it because I've asked, what are, you, what are people, what are you trying to forget? Because right. that thing or things that we're trying to forget is taking up space, maybe in the subconscious where we're still feeling those emotions. It triggers the same emotional response, which triggers the same behavior, which creates that suffering. So yeah. 
how would someone like you, you mentioned also regaining and realizing your power as a man and as a human, how can someone start processing that to re- recognize their power in changing their yeah. circumstance? Well, I, I think first and foremost, being open to that change. One of the things that had happened to me, and I think this happens to a lot of people, I, I, this happens to everybody, I think, but especially to people who have had a mental illness for a long time, uh, people who have had depression for, say, many years, like I did, that becomes part of your identity. And then, you know, in a way, that's a coping mechanism to identify as a depressed person or an anxious person or whatever. Um, but then it becomes prohibitive as well. It starts to con- constrain you and you resist, you find all kinds of ways to resist not being that person, to let go of that identity as someone with depression. Uh, and while at the same time saying, I wish I didn't have this, there's still part of you that kind of clings to it in a way, at least that's, that was my personal experience. So I think being able to let go of that and what's on the other side of identity, at least initially, there's nothing. There's just complete potentiality. Uh, and that's terrifying for most people. Most people don't want to be launched into the unknown. Don't, uh, they don't want to let go of this, this cape that they're wearing, this mask that they're wearing, because then what? Well, and I think it was only when I actually started to do that, and, and sometimes gradually, sometimes just launching myself into it, that I was able to recreate myself into more of who I really felt that I wanted to be and really needed to be in many ways. Um, You know, there's a lot of people who are afraid to take medication, for example, for a lot of good reasons, don't get me wrong. I had a heck of a time with with antidepressants and uh, anti-anxiety medications, antipsychotics, I was on anti-seizure medication, I was on cocktails of dozens of medications. And eventually I found one that worked pretty okay for me for a few years. Uh, And now I don't take anything at all, but I am grateful that I eventually found one that worked quite well. Um, But there are some people who really don't want to go through that, again, for understandable reasons, because they feel like it's taking away part of who they are. And that for me is a a bit of an indicator that they're becoming maybe um, a a bit clinging uh, to that identity of who they think they are. Uh, So I think a big... Uh, next step, I think, in my recovery was letting go of who I thought I needed to be uh, and then just let myself define myself. You know, it's a bit hard to describe in some ways, but I think that for me, that openness uh, to new experience was really what launched my recovery into the next, uh, into the next stage, uh, I think. So, I mean, that that was uh, helpful for me, not clinging to who either I thought people wanted me to be or who I thought I needed to be. Yeah, man, you just touch on one the the biggest topics I think is that identity and what we're identifying with because those thoughts of helplessness or hopelessness we start identifying that as that's who we are or I am this emotion. I am depressed versus I'm feeling right. depressed or these are feelings and feelings are temporary. Their emotions have a beginning, middle and end, but identity that stays, that sticks. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge piece, right? I think we spend so much time too worrying about what other people think of us, even if Mm -hmm. people say, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. Yes, you do. Everybody does. It's normal. Uh, but I think it, to a, when it gets to a degree uh, where you're defining yourself by other people, uh, then it becomes a problem. You know, you have to have emotional intelligence. You do have to care about people around you and how they react and uh, how your actions Im- impact them. Um, but you also have to stop and ask yourself, uh, you know, am I not being my true self? because I'm afraid of what other people will think of me. I don't want to open up about my depression or anxiety or suicidal history or whatever it is, because what what will my employer think? What will my spouse or partner think? What will my friends think? Well, there's two, you know, I'm I'm of two thoughts of that. One is that people are actually generally more forgiving than we give them credit for, Uh, especially when you're depressed. I find you, everybody seems a lot worse than they really are. Uh, And that's kind of the, that's the, the tint 
that the that depression puts on the world at least it did for me it made everything look gross and angry and and unforgiving and all that stuff and actually people were way more welcoming uh, when i opened up than i thought they were going to be um, and the other part of it is there are going to be some people who don't like your experience who don't like your life then you need to ask yourself your question are these my people are these the people that I, re do I want to be the person they want me to be, uh, who is hiding, making them uncomfortable? Or do I want to be the person that I really am? And I think that's a really, it's a difficult question. There's no question. Uh, but I, I think it's an important question because then when you open up, uh, you will lose some people uh, in your life. There will be people who don't understand. And sometimes those people will be really close to you. You know, teenagers, uh, why doesn't my, why don't my parents understand what I'm going through? Because they're your parents and they just might not understand. And that's okay. They don't have to. <laughs> All you can do is be who you are, uh, do, do, do some of the work for them, uh, but you can't convince them of anything. And just like, likewise, nobody can do your recovery for you. Nobody's going to inject recovery into you. Your mental illness might not be your fault. Your, your trauma might not be your fault, but your recovery is your responsibility. So it's kind of, you get to a place where it's like, well, this is what it is. What now? <laughs> you know, huge, you do, man. you do have more yeah. choice than you think. No, I love that because it's, I think the expectation that someone else has to fix something for you, right? Because once you, yeah. I, I believe as difficult that it is, right? You said perfectly, the trauma is not your fault. It could be whatever the case, it might not be your fault, but the, the recovery is your responsibility. And I think yeah. that's the, that's such a fundamental shift because it is your responsibility. Once you're able to respond in a way that allows that recovering to happen, right? Opening the space in it, whether that's inviting people, talking to certain people and, and things like that, that starts the healing process. I yeah. believe. And, and with that, Mark, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut you no, off. Well, I was just going to say, you know, on that, I, I think, um, it's important for yourself and if you're helping others uh, that there still needs to be a validation phase right at the at the start, you know, recognizing that that thing that happened to you shouldn't have happened to you. You know, that was terrible. I think that's really important to, to do that initial processing. And when you're trying to help somebody else saying to them, Could just forget about all that stuff and get over it and move on. Not the most helpful thing. That's when you're going to shut somebody down. So you do need to acknowledge, validate, accept that initial stuff, but you also don't want to get mired in that. You do need to take the next steps and that's that's hard. In some ways it's easier to stay stuck in the mud of hating that person who did that thing to you or regretting and, and wishing things weren't the way they are. Uh, I love this idea of acceptance and change that you can only really change, you can only really let go and move on uh, when you accept the way things are. You don't have to like them. They shouldn't, they don't have to be that way, but they are. Uh, so you need to be able to accept that things as they are uh, and then allow yourself and work to change. Dude, super powerful, super powerful. And man, I, I really hope people re-listen to this over and over if they are thinking of these things because you're just unleashing so much powerful information. And, and one last thing that I wanted to ask because you have so much experience and, and you've advocated all around the world and so many platforms. If someone came to you right now and said, Mark, I'm thinking about killing myself. What, what is your response? Wait, I think we fall into this trap when we're suicidal, uh, where we are absolutely convinced uh, that we think that tomorrow will be like today and like yesterday and like every other day, because our perception because so, becomes so tiny in that little tiny space, if we're able to actually wait and let it breathe and not uh, assume uh, that, that everything will stay static and frozen the way that it often does when you're suicidal, when we let that go and allow things to start to change a little bit, I think that's what uh, allows us to open up and, and start to get out of that place a little bit more impermanence, <laughs> change is the only constant, that old cliche, uh, but it's so true, you know, and I, I, I think remembering that if you're suicidal, that everything changes, this too shall pass, everything shall pass, whether it's, it's struggle uh, or celebration, 
uh, both hate and love will evolve and change over time. And I think that helps us to get through difficult times by realizing that it won't always be this hard. And it also helps us to be more grateful uh, of the things that we love and that we enjoy, at least I hope it does, because those things won't last either. So if you can get into this place of, of impermanence, uh, that nothing is forever, uh, I think that helps you, helps me anyway, to cope with those really difficult times uh, and also to really cherish and amplify uh, those great and positive times. So, so don't make any uh, rash decisions, of course, that uh, things will change. Uh, it's, it's up to you if you actually see them change. Super powerful, super powerful. Mark, I, I just want to say appreciate you very, very much. And the greatest gift I believe we can give is ourselves and our time. And I'm glad that man in the brown jacket saved you because you've been given this gift of yourself to so many people, including me and, and my listeners and my platform and whoever sees this. So I appreciate you and I appreciate that. And, and just want to let you give your uh, best place to contact you at. I will definitely have all your information linked, but for any preferences for you and people reaching out to you. Sure. Well, I'm not very hard to find. Uh, I'm on most social media platforms at Mark Hennick. That's at M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, <laughs> everywhere else. Uh, my book is so-called Normal, A Memoir of Family Depression and Resilience. That's available on uh, Amazon worldwide, as well as major bookstores worldwide, like Barnes & Noble, Waterstones, Indigo, and, uh, and many others. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate your time. And if you're thinking of harming yourself or thinking about suicide, really take a hard listen to this again and understand that those feelings, those thoughts are not you. They're not who you are. You are a gift and those thoughts are just thoughts. They, those emotions have a beginning, middle and end and you have so much more to give. Thank you, Mark, for joining me today. That is all for this episode. Thank you for tuning in. If you found any value in this episode, someone you know will also. Please share, subscribe, leave a rating and review so we can reach more people, have a farther ripple and a larger impact. Stay grateful. I appreciate you. And remember, you are a conqueror.